I'll be the first to admit I've probably got too many projects going on. And if you add to that all of the cars that belong to friends of mine, the shop is getting pretty full. Given that I've been out of town for the last two weeks and it's been six whole months since we last touched the Audi Quattro, it should come as no surprise that it's buried all the way at the back. So if we want to work on it, we're going to have to pull everything out of the shop and wake it from its slumber. And let's get it out of the way, no, I don't own the black Ferrari, and the 1600 belongs to my girlfriend. The white E30 belonged to my late friend Corey, and we recently put it back together, so check that episode out if you missed it. So we're three for three for cars that I don't own, however, I guess I should fess up and say I did buy this white E28 a number of months ago, and I promise we'll touch upon it in a later episode. But with all of these cars out of the way, we can finally pull the Audi out from under Khalil's E36, and knock the dust off. With this thing out of sight and out of mind, it was easy to forget how cool it really is, and it's easy to forget exactly where we left off. So here's the crash course reminder. We bought a 2.2 liter AAN engine out of an Ur S4. We're swapping it in because the original motor came with a blown head gasket, and I like excuses for more power. The downside, though, is that I was told I was buying a good engine, but what arrived looked like it came from the bottom of the ocean. And with power goals of around 500 all-wheel horsepower, I figured we should take the opportunity and tear this thing down for a rebuild. So with the help of my friends next door at Leichtbau, who specialize in restoring classic European cars, we got down to business. We tore both the bottom end and the top end down for service, and that's where things began to spiral a little bit out of control. But honestly, is anybody even surprised at this point? Instead of taking the head to a local shop for service, I crated it up and sent it to Germany. And two months later, that same crate arrived back home. Given that most of my viewers are here in the United States, you're probably not familiar with NG Motorsports. But to put it simply, they specialize in CNC cylinder head work. And one of their specialties is Audis. I told the team at NG Motorsports I was only looking to make around 500 horsepower at the wheels, but they responded that that really didn't need much work, and if we were going to do this, we should take it all the way. And what returned to the United States was an absolute work of art. So let's start with the obvious. The chambers themselves have received CNC machining, which has a number of benefits. For one, it removes any variance between the cylinders when it comes to compression ratio, and it also removes hot spots within the cylinder head thanks to an improved surface. Furthermore, the valves have been unshrouded, and we've upgraded our valve seats to copper beryllium and have given the valves a three-angle valve job. We've got tapered valve guides for improved flow, and most notably, there's been some amazing CNC work within the intake and exhaust ports themselves. The flow characteristics have been improved dramatically, and with a cylinder head, more flow means more power. It's as simple as that. But if you clicked on this video, you're probably wondering, what gives with the dimples inside the intake ports? Or if you're familiar with them, maybe you want to know for certain, do they actually work? Or maybe you're just here to call me out and say this is all smoke and mirrors. Whatever the case may be, I'm going to do my best to explain the concepts behind this, and we're going to take a closer look to admire it because whether or not it works, we can at least agree the work performed here by NG Motorsports is absolutely gorgeous. So let's dive in. There are multiple ways to achieve this dimpled effect. It can be done by hand, but in our case, NG Motorsports uses a 5-axis CNC machine to do it, which yields much more uniform dimples, and more importantly, dimples that are the correct depth, just like a golf ball. The dimples on the surface of a golf ball play a critical role. They create turbulence in the air on its surface, and through reasons I can't fully explain, that allows the air around the ball to travel smoother and faster across its surface, and that in turn allows the ball to fly faster and further through the air. NG Motorsports applies the same idea to the intake port of our head. Turbulent air against the surface of the head allows the air in the volume of the port to travel faster into the cylinder and thus can create more power. On the other hand, there are some important differences at play too. Golf balls spin as they go through the air, and cylinder heads flow considerably more air than a golf ball sees as it flies. 
So quite fairly, there's a lot of discussion out there about whether or not this stuff works, because it's been around since the 60s. But if you look around, you can find flow bench data that shows increased airflow through a cylinder head with correct dimpling applied. It's not a massive difference, but it does add up. Given that NG Motorsports has a flow bench of their own and stands by their work, I'm excited to do the same and get this engine running to see what it can actually do. But on that note, let's walk back next door to see the guys at Leichtbau because they have an engine block with my name on it. Believe it or not, this is the same engine block that we disassembled in the last episode, and after some heavy treatment, it's looking a lot better than it did before. We've yet to paint it, but at least the basic machining is done. We had our factory crankshaft checked and trued, and although the cylinder walls looked pretty good, there was some room for improvement, so we went with a 20 over bore. And if you're thinking to yourself, Mike, this is getting out of hand, well, why not go all the way and add some JE pistons to the mix so we can improve our compression ratio and go up with the boost. Thankfully and surprisingly, JE Pistons has parts for this motor on the shelf, so this wasn't even a custom order. Now I know that the factory AAN pistons are, frankly, fantastic, and there's not a need to replace them, but given that race winning brands was willing to send this stuff over, I wasn't going to turn down the opportunity to turn this engine into something, well, more than I had originally planned. So why not add forged Weissco boost line rods to the mix while we're at it, right? I've been told that the factory rods are the first thing to go once you reach the give or take 600 horsepower level. But with these rods, the pistons, the cylinder head, and all of the other work we're doing, we're going to be in a position to make maybe even more power than the Ferrari makes. These old five cylinders are easily capable of making a thousand horsepower with the right parts, and this is how you get there. Some people might call this scope creep, but if you're going to ask me, I'm going to label this as building the most reliable 500 wheel horsepower motor possible. And hey, if you're going to lean into it, you might as well lean into it, so let's throw another box of parts at this thing to take it all the way. The crew at ECS Tuning sent over a care package for the Audi once they found out what I was building, and thankfully their parts catalog includes a lot of high performance stuff that'll help this engine come together successfully. Now as the build plans have changed a little bit, we won't necessarily use everything here, but we've got a lot of great stuff to work with. For starters, we've got new upgraded modern Audi coil packs and an ARP head stud kit meant specifically for building power. We've got things like new hydraulic lifters, a new water pump, all new gaskets, new seals, pretty much everything to put this motor back in one piece, and some 034 Motorsport goodies like motor mounts to scratch the surface. Now don't worry, no, we're not done with the new parts yet. In fact, we're just getting started, because I've also been sitting on this box from H&R for about two months. And there's no surprises here, inside this box we've got a brand new set of H&R coilovers for the Quattro. And thankfully, this time around, these are just gonna bolt on. Some of you may remember from the last episode that I highlighted the fundamental differences between the Ur Quattro uprights and the Coupe Quattro uprights that we have swapped to, namely the fact that the original upright for this car is a single solid piece of steel, which makes it really hard to upgrade to a complete coilover. So between that and parts availability, we made the decision to swap over to Coupe Quattro subframes, and that allows us to use S2 coilovers that will simply bolt to the knuckle and gives us an off-the-shelf solution. The coilovers also have beefy steel integrated steering arms, which should work really well, but we might have to modify our tie rods to get them down to the correct length. Needless to say, I'm really eager to put these coilovers on the car, but we've got more work to do before that. If we rewind to our last episode where we disassembled the Coupe Quattro subframes, the idea was to get them ready for powder coating. And that's where the boys from Motorsport Powder Coating in Redlands, California have come in. As Audi fanatics, they urged me to keep them in mind when the time came for powder coating, and with subframes, I knew exactly who to call. It might be boring, but I opted for a factory satin black. I want this car to appear restored underneath, and I have to say the guys at Motorsport Powder Coating absolutely nailed it. These things look like they have just arrived new from Audi. But we all know that's impossible because nothing is available for these freaking cars. But I digress, they worked their same magic on the factory control arms, both the forged fronts and the stamped rears. 
I've had a lot of parts powder coated over the years, and so it's nice to see an attention to detail, such as making sure none of the threads have overspray and that all of the bearing mount surfaces are clean on the inside. Sure, anything can be dealt with, but it's nice to not have to. What we do have to deal with, though, are the knuckles. Unfortunately, I haven't gotten them powder coated yet, and that's because in our suspension disassembly episode, I was unable to get the bearings out of them. My Arbor Press flexed the one inch thick piece of steel this thing was sitting upon, so I was under the impression this wasn't gonna be doable without an oxyacetylene torch and a lot of heat. But as I always do when I need help, I turned to Brett Walker over at Nimmo Machine and lent on him for a helping hand. Between his Arbor Press and his additional might, he was able to pop all four bearings out without much of an issue. So it turns out I should have just done this months ago. Now, once we get those knuckles back from powder coating, we can put all of the suspension back together and then put it back on the car, put the car back on the ground and measure for wheels. And that's an important step because we're gonna go with a custom set of 16s. Once again, thanks to our friends at Rotiform. The 16s is because I think everybody gets the sizing on these cars wrong. Everybody goes with 17s or 18s and they fill the arch nicely, but the side of the car is a really short side profile. They need 16s. I'm gonna stand firmly on it. I will not put anything bigger on it, even if I gotta change brakes around or what have you. I'm gonna die on that hill. But given that we're gonna go to Coupe Quattro suspension, I know that there's a change in track width. I don't know how much. We need to measure for offsets so that we can get the three-piece wheels fitted to the car correctly. I wanna fit a nice, probably 225 tire on this thing. I don't know if a 245 will fit square, but we gotta find out. That's why we gotta put it on the ground and measure it. The only downside is that in order to put all the suspension back on the car, we gotta put the subframe back in. It means we've gotta pull it all back apart to put the engine back in once we get there. But I don't wanna delay and hold everything up, so I think that's gonna be our next checklist item. So let's wait for those parts to come back from powder coating. Maybe we'll have them in the next week or two. But I've got one other trick up my sleeve. I bought a new tool specifically for this project, and it's gonna be an adventure. Check it out. You guys know at this point that I love tools. I wouldn't call this a tool in the traditional sense, but this is definitely a tool for the fabrication arsenal. What we have here is a relatively affordable Einstar 3D scanner, and you've probably seen this thing elsewhere on YouTube. For starters, our friend Matt Brown over at Superfast Matt has been using it for his Viper build, and he swore in one of his previous episodes that this is a must-have tool, and I'm inclined to agree. I actually bought this thing almost six months ago, but I haven't used it very much yet because I've been saving the learning process to share with you guys on video. But I have done a few trial scans like this original Honda engine mount, and I'm excited to see how useful this is gonna be. But the question is, how are we gonna use it on the Audi? Well, take a look at the front end. If we compare this thing to the Sport Quattro, you'll notice that the Sport Quattro has a much cooler, more aggressive single square headlight setup. As an early car, mine has what are known as quads, and amongst the options for these cars, they're my least favorite. Unfortunately, getting a Sport Quattro front end isn't really doable, so I've decided to get a 3D scanner, scan the front of my car, and build our own. Why not use the 3D scanner, 3D printing, and the mold making process to build a Sport Quattro front end that fits on an original Audi Quattro? I think it'll be an update that will really be a perfect finishing touch for the exterior of this car, and what better way than to learn a bunch of new skills all at once. Now some of you guys will say, hey Mike, there's already a company that makes a Sport Quattro grill, a Sport Quattro front end conversion for your car. You could just buy it instead of making it yourself. And to that I would say, yes, I know, and unfortunately I bought that front end two whole years ago, as well as I bought an entire carbon Sport Quattro body for this car. If you remember back to my first episode when I said, yeah, we're gonna cut this up, well, that was the original plan. I'm just saying, I'm not gonna cut the car in half, but we are going to cut it up. This is not gonna be your ordinary Quattro, I promise you that. Obviously that didn't happen. I don't have my body work yet. I've been waiting for two years after paying in full for it, and at this point, I am pretty sure I got scammed. And that's a story for a different day. I gotta decide how much laundry to air there. I'm not trying to burn any bridges. I'm not trying to start a war. I just don't want anybody else to get scammed by the same company. But I'm also not trying to start drama with a company or a channel or anything like that. And I'm just trying to build my cars in peace and have fun. And that's what I'm more focused on. 
But in all, it sucks. You try to support other companies in the community and you get burned. With that said, after diving into the car, taking it apart and realizing how nice this thing is, I don't really want to cut it up and put a wide body on it anymore anyway. I'm really happy with the shape of this car. So maybe a silver lining there, aside from you know getting screwed out of thousands and thousands of dollars I can't really afford to throw away. But anyways, that's a topic for a different day, a different episode. Maybe we'll dive into it later. For now, we should talk about what else is in the pipeline aside from the suspension. Right now, I need to focus on getting a lot of other parts in order. We need to get our standalone from Haltech in, and we need a bunch of fabrication supplies from Vibrant Performance. We've got to build a turbo manifold. We've got to come up with an intake plenum solution. We've got to do a bunch of fluid plumbing like our fuel. We need to build an intercooler. We've got to get our CSF radiator installed. We've got a ton of work to do on this swap as well as sending out the transmission to get built and upgraded. I need to find a rear diff if anybody's holding one. I think it's a 411 rear ratio and ideally something with a limited slip if that's even an option. I don't know yet. I'm still learning my way through this car. But the idea is to get as many irons in the fire as we can so this build goes smoothly. I want get it done in short order. I don't want it to drag on, you know, through the end of the year. That's not the plan here. I want to get this knocked out. I'm excited about it. And it is simple in comparison to the Ferrari. We're not doing anything that hasn't been done before. We're just trying to do it well. So with that said, I got some planning to do. I'm excited that we're back on this thing. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Apologies for the show and tell episode, but hopefully it was fun. I'm going to get to work. I'll catch you guys next week. Thanks as always for the support.